Please be seated. And turn with me, if you will, to the Old Testament reading that we heard earlier, the 73rd Psalm. And I particularly focus your thoughts on verses 21 to 26, although I will be making some passing references to the verses before and after where we read, Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion for ever. Now, part of the reason why I feel led this evening to turn your thoughts towards this psalm arises out of a visit we made on Friday uh, to Northampton. Mm -hmm. I think some of you know the significance of that. Mm -hmm. This so happens to be the... Uh, the 50th anniversary of my ordination in Northampton, my golden ordination, I think, would be the appropriate um, language. And uh, that took place in August of 1969. And uh, soon after that, two very dear Christian people came into our lives, Les and Joyce Sandal. And although they were members of another church in Northampton, they continue to show an interest in us and our young and growing family. They were great supporters and uh, they have never failed to show tangible support and encouragement to us through 50 years. And uh, they are gems of Christians and we will ever thank God for them. But now, as we speak, dear Joyce is dying. She has esophageal cancer. This was diagnosed some months ago and she has been slowly deteriorating. And uh, because of her condition, we decided to visit them both on Friday. So we travelled the 100 miles from Atterborough to Northampton and uh, we saw them, and uh, we had a sad but blessed time. Dear Les, bless him, he was doing what he's been doing for some time now, showing such tender, loving care to Joyce. Mm -hmm. Such a busy carer he, he is, whilst Joyce herself was um, lying down in the armchair, and we noticed a difference. Uh, her face was looking very tired and very drawn. But uh, we were so impressed by the wonderful fact that she is resting in Christ. Mm. She knows where she's going. She is trusting in Him. Mm. And just before we left, the last words I spoke to her Goodbye, Joyce. We will meet again, either in the glory mm. or here again, because she might last a little longer. And if that's the case, we would hope to see them again uh, as the time passes by. But uh, before we pray together, uh, I read part of Psalm 73, this very psalm, in fact, really from verses 21 down to the end of the psalm. It is so suitable to her need, but also to our need. Because, as we read from the book of Job, that man is born into trouble as the sparks fly, fly upward. We brought nothing into this world and we shall carry nothing out. Life is short. It is, from a human perspective, 
very uncertain. Mm. And therefore to imagine that life will go on, that we can simply live according to the philosophy, let us eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and exclude all these things and just have fun, get as much pleasure as we possibly can. If that's the attitude, then there will be a rude awakening, because death is coming to all of us. Mm. And that's not a case of being morbid, it's simply being honest and being realistic. So it's very wonderful to see the way that Joyce, the look on her face has said, said it all. She knows the Lord's presence, she knows that he is near, and she is resting in, in him. And that is the huge difference that being a Christian makes, and it's wonderful to, to see that. I also mentioned because uh, we have a certain common background in that uh, Les and Joyce were, were married by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones at Westminster Chapel, I think in the very early 60s. And uh, they later moved to Northampton. And they were there, ready, so to speak, for when we moved to the town in July 1969. And around that time, I, who had worshipped in Westminster Chapel, uh, between 1963 and 1966, before I went to university to meet Marion. The, um, one of the books that I was greatly helped by as a young Christian minister was a book by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, it is called Faith on Trial, a series of sermons based on Psalm 73. It is a terrific book, and uh, perhaps second only to his famous sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. And Dr. Lloyd-Jones' ministry continues worldwide, globally. And if you do have access to the internet, then do a Google search and listen to his sermons. You'll hear things that you will never wish to forget. So there was that contact uh, uh, as well uh, via Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And you only have to read this psalm and to see how beautifully applicable it is to people in Joyce's condition and also in our condition because we don't need to wait until we're at death's door before we reap the sweetness and the comfort of the gospel. The more we are built up in the faith now, especially while we're young, if we're not old, then that is the best way to prepare uh, for these things. We never know when death might strike. There was an accident on the A11 uh, very recently when uh, a deer crossed the carriageway between uh, Wyndham and Norwich and uh, there was an accident and um, a driver was killed instantly and another oh. lady drove into, into his car oh. so suddenly. So it's right and proper that we, we look at a message like Psalm 73. Now unlike most of the Psalms, which are written by David, this is written by Asaph. Now we don't know a great deal about Asaph. He is regarded uh, as a prophet, and that's why he's included uh, in the Psalms. He's a much less colourful figure than, than David, but there's in many respects a certain steadiness and commitment to God which wasn't always evident in the life of, of King David, whose psalms we are more familiar with. And Psalm 73 is one of those psalms which uh, is tailor-made for human beings like us, struggling with the realities of life. And um, he really had endured a, a crisis in his spiritual life which was occasioned by the fact that uh, he looked at the way people were living, the lifestyle of so many people, who seemed to be quite comfortable, quite happy, quite cheerful. Uh, they didn't seem to need God. They just lived their lives. They enjoyed all the pleasures of life. And uh, they didn't seem to be worried about life or death and, or eternity and so forth. And they seemed perfectly at ease, perfectly happy smiling from ear to ear, from day to day. And this troubled Asaph because he was a man of God. So he, he tells us his experience. What's interesting is the way that the, the psalm uh, begins with the conclusion. 
Look, in the opening verse, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. That's a kind of a conclusion. You compare that with the last verse of the psalm, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. And the sentiments are very similar, aren't they? So he's really saying, I want to share with you a story, a a personal crisis in my own soul, as it were. But I want to start off, he says, I want you to be assured that um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, God, the living God, is good to Israel, to his people, to those who trust in him, to such as are pure in heart. And then he goes on to tell us his story. And then he returns to the conclusion at the end. And what's remarkable about the psalm is that uh, it's really in two halves. You see him reflecting or considering the lives of others around him. And the more he looks at them, the more he examines their faces and their lives and their seeming uh, contentment in life. He gets more and more depressed. And he gradually goes down, 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 downhill. Until he reaches verse 17 where there's a big turning point. And from that point, he starts to go up, 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 reaching his conclusion that the best way to live is to put your trust in God. So it's a remarkable psalm in this particular uh, respect. I'd like also to link this up with our reading from the New Testament tonight, from Luke chapter 12, our blessed Lord's familiar parable of the Rich fool, the man who uh, was content with his business success. He thought he would expand his business and that he would um, tear down his old barns and extend the buildings and the complex. And uh, he would uh, sit back and take his pleasure and uh, rejoice in all his success. And he thought he was virtually living in paradise. And then our Lord says, but... uh, God would, came to him at night and said, uh, you fool, who are those things, uh, who, who will those things be after you have died? Because you are accountable to God and one day, whether you like it or not, you're going to die. I'm paraphrasing our, our Lord's words. And then the man was a fool. He was a rich fool. Yes, very, very rich, but very, very foolish because God didn't have a place in his thinking. And so Jesus says, it's, it's good to be, to be rich in God's grace, not rich in this world's possessions. And um, we should also remember that um, the Psalms are important because Paul calls the Psalms the word of Christ. We shouldn't forget that. Uh, The Psalms are the word of Christ. Now, I don't know whether you've seen them, but sometimes you come across Bibles, they're called red print edition Bibles, where they have the words of Jesus printed in red, uh, because they're the very words of Jesus. I don't like those kind of Bibles. I think it's misleading. Yes, there were certain recorded statements and messages and parables of our blessed Lord which came from the lips of Jesus of Nazareth. But it's true to say that the whole of the Bible is the word of Christ. The Psalms are the word of Christ. Paul's specific about that. But since the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal revealer whereby God the Father reveals to mankind his will and his demands upon us, and the way of salvation, there's a sense in which the whole Bible is the word of Christ. So we shouldn't, at the deepest level, make a distinction. And of course there are certain links between Psalm 73 and Luke 12. After all, don't we know the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart? What do we have here? Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ warned the rich fool against resting upon his wealth, we find here Asaph speaking about the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. That's the rich fool, isn't it? Summed up in the Old Testament. So let's be clear about this. The Bible is one message. It is one book. It has two halves, but it is one revealed reality. 
which ought to make us confident in every part of the scriptures that we, we, that we read. So then, let's spend a little time on seeing the way that Asaph was brought into his very um, despairing and depressed uh, condition because he immediately launches into his consideration of the state of the ungodly. Uh, he says, uh, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had, all, had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's the state of those who say, well, we'll not worry about religion, we'll not worry about God, we're here to enjoy ourselves, to enjoy our prosperity. That's what life is all about. And, uh, and then he describes the way that they thought about life. In verse 4, For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment, their eyes bulge with abundance, they have more than heart could wish, they scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Is any of that familiar to you? It's today, isn't it? It's the attitude of our secularists, the atheists, and those who wish to dismiss God from every consideration in human life. It's all here. I hardly need to comment upon the details. But at least one thinks of the alarm that there is over the increase in violent crime. Uh, in our society, knife crime in particular. Well, Asaph says that violence covers them like a garment. And think of the affluence that there is. Everyone is concerned to make as much as possible. They have more than heart could wish, and they scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. And with arrogance do they speak against God, against righteousness, Anyone and everyone is allowed to do their own thing, however wicked, however filthy, however vile, but Christians aren't allowed to express their view or to make criticisms of them. They dismiss any Christian comment on the decadence of our society as simply hate crime, and they will not tolerate us. Everyone and any, everything will be tolerated except Christianity, except Christians. Well, this kind of thing was taking, taking place here. And poor Asaph, uh, it troubled him. It, it depressed him. And isn't that a danger for us, that very often we can look around us, we can switch on a program on the television or on, on, on the radio, and hear these people mouthing off their anti-Christianity in various ways. And it can intimidate us. It can, it can make us less confident in... in opening our mouths for Christ when we have an opportunity. They're bold in their unbelief, unchecked, unchallenged. And uh, such a rare thing if ever there is a, a Christian clergyman on, in, in the media who will dare to raise a, a protest against the wickedness of our society. Well, this was how poor old Asaph was feeling. Uh, and he begins to even wonder whether he's on the wrong side at the end of the day. Living a, a righteous life, doing the right thing, being truthful, honest, kind and pure and considerate. Uh, to be a good human being at least. Um, is it not a waste of time when there's so much crime and so much uh, prosperity of a dodgy, dubious kind? Look what he says in verse 10. Therefore his people return here. The waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? But these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. So here is the description of the ungodly person. The secular person. The person who doesn't wish to have any sense of responsibility or accountability to God as our creator, as our lawgiver and as our judge. 
And then, having considered the state of the ungodly as he does, look at the damaging impact this has on his spirit, his sense of spiritual identity. In other words, he starts to honestly say that he's in a state of spiritual crisis. Look how he puts it. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He felt so utterly demoralized as a man of God. Is it worth it in the end? He was tempted to throw in the towel, if I might use that expression. Others seem to get by without God quite happily. Here am I, I live a life of acknowledging my sins and confessing them before God, seeking his grace, seeking his strength and grace to um, live a life of righteousness, to do battle against the world, the flesh and the devil. Mm -hmm. And uh, these people, they couldn't care less about that kind of thing and they seem to get away with it day in and day out. That's the crisis that he has in his life so but there's something very private here because this is like a private diary in a sense he doesn't want to go public he doesn't want to go all around Jerusalem and saying all you people who are wanting to serve God uh, are we not wasting our time at the end of the day look at the ungodly look how happy they are look how buoyant they are but look at us we seem to be so miserable and we're trying to follow God. You can understand how he's feeling. I wonder if you and I ever feel tempted to think in these terms. I think this is a temptation which does come not only to Asaph but to all of us at some time or other. Is it any point going to church and being honest and straight and true unlike the world in which we are living? But then look how he's wrestling with his soul in verse 15. If I had said I would speak thus, if I would tell others and trumpet it abroad that I'm feeling disillusioned with everything that I believe, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. So he feels all this doubt and disillusionment in his soul. He's afraid to be too public about it because he knows that there are other people who are struggling. They haven't reached his degree of doubt and disillusionment and he doesn't want to upset them and to rob them of the assurance of their faith. So he's really wrestling with himself. Then something happens. Something happens. Verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God... Then understood I their end. Something happened at this particular point. And it really boils down to this. That in all his consideration of the state of the ungodly, he's been surveying their lifestyle from a purely human point of view. He's looking at it from the perspective of rebellious Sinful, self-sufficient, conceited man. He thinks they're okay, but in fact they are not. And it's almost as if he's wandering around Jerusalem, going past the cafes, going past the market stalls, people drinking beer and wine out in the sunshine, not interested in church or the word of God or any of these things and over there is the temple and the temple comes into view and then he goes into the temple and then as he looks around the temple he's suddenly reminded of the wonderful heritage that was (coughs) Israel's and he would see the holy of holies he would see the ark of the covenant That amazing entity in which was contained the two tablets of stone on which God engraved with his own finger the Ten Commandments. Placed there with Aaron's rod that budded. 
and on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, which speaks of the mercy of God to those who, having transgressed his law and broken the Ten Commandments, come to him in repentance. The righteousness of God, the mercy of God, the broken tablets, the, 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 the broken laws that the tablets uh, stipulated, but there's hope for those through God's mercy. And then he would have realized the long history of Israel. So embedded in the consciousness of the people. Except for those who were trying to shake it off. They say we, we want to live in a new age. We don't want all this religion. We want, don't want God. We want our own ungodly way. But he suddenly realized what a heritage he had. Now I think we must make the point that uh, as I've often said that in the Old Testament God had a temple for his people mm. but now he has his people for his temple mm. and therefore we ought not to think about churches and religious buildings and cathedrals in the same way that the Old Testament looked upon the temple and uh, as I have expressed fairly recently there was great doubt uh, we who have a, a magnificent architectural specimen in Norwich Cathedral admittedly no one denies that for one moment, but uh, in the um, the early uh, to mid 11th century, when which was the dawn of the cathedral uh, building era in Europe as a whole, when cathedrals like Norwich were popping up all over Europe um, at great expense, and the saintly Bernard of Clairvaux uh, wasn't impressed, and he thought that the investment, the money that was being used, would be better used to help the ignorant with education and to help the poor in their conditions. He wasn't impressed by these fine buildings, which is quite remarkable. No wonder that Martin Luther thought that Bernard was the best monk of the Middle Ages. John Calvin quoted from Bernard's sermons in his Institutes of the Christian uh, Religion. Uh, I, I say all this, but at the same time, we still are able to walk through the city and look at the religious buildings and see that they do indicate that there has been a Christian past. Whatever's happening at the present, there have been those who went into these buildings uh, to worship God and to hear his word read and preached, to sing his praise, to partake of the sacraments. There have been godly people in the past and these buildings are a, a kind of a legacy. They are a signpost to better values from a greater age. So there's a limited sense in which we could do the same thing. What a dreadful thing that in many parts of our country you have mosques popping up. Once Christian buildings being turned into mosques. And in some cases non-conformist chapels being turned into laundrettes and private dwellings and I don't know what. So our culture is changing because we've driven God out. But we're still able to be reminded that we do have a heritage. That's the kind of thing that Asaph was doing at this particular point. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, I was reminded by the law of God and the mercy of God that God has revealed to us through his servant Moses, proclaimed through the priesthood, proclaimed by the prophets, proclaimed by King David in his Psalms and Asaph is now really saying and now I too am inspired by the Spirit of God to contribute a few Psalms to the Psalter as well. So this was the turning point uh, into uh, uh, which was the end of the descent and the beginning of the ascent back to faith and confidence in God. And at the same time, he reevaluates the condition of those whom he had been envious about. That's what we, we read, wasn't it, early? Uh, I was envious of the boastful. Hang on, he says. Verse 18, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you should despise their image. In other words, he's saying this. They look happy enough, but, but deep down they're not very happy. They smile, but they are miserable inside. 
And it's often been said that among the most miserable people in the entertainment in- industry are the comedians. There was a story, I hope I can remember it uh, correctly, that a man who was depressed, he went to see his doctor, and the doctor said, you ought to go to that show in the theatre across the city and be entertained, have a good laugh. That'll cheer you up. And go and hear that clown of a comedian. It'll really do you good. And the man said, Doctor, I am that clown. And that's just one example that uh, and others could be given to illustrate that. In other words, for all their seeming prosperity and jollity and so forth, things are not, in fact, as it appears. And we often hear, don't we, celebrities in the music industry and politics and so forth who seem to have had a glittering career, a dazzling performance as they could deliver, and how they end up in a suicidal state. Well, that's really what he's saying here, isn't he? So these people who are confident against God, they're not so confident as they seem. There's an example that I remember reading about many years ago. There was once um, a Methodist minister called Peter McKenzie. He was a Methodist minister in the Sunderland circuit up in the northeast. He was quite a character with quite a, a turn of phrase. And he would talk about a rather uh, over talkative man who said, he said of him he could, uh, he could sing a duet all by himself. And he s- described um, Jonah's experience in being swallowed by the great fish. Here he was and then the whale says to Jonah coming out of the wet. He was that kind of popular Methodist preacher of the time. But he was a man full of faith. He was greatly blessed He was an evangelist in the footsteps of John Wesley, but in the 19th century. And uh, on one occasion, Peter Mackenzie went across to France, and he went to Paris. And he went to the house where that arch-skeptic and anti-Christian lived, known as Voltaire. And uh, he was a philosopher. And uh, he assessed Christianity and found it wanting. He wasn't very impressed with these, these Christians. And he was confident in his assessments and in his analysis. But do you know that when Voltaire, the skeptic, came to die, according to the accounts, as his last breath was drawing near, he went screaming into eternity. He wasn't so confident or so cheerful as he'd been throughout his life, dismissing religion, dismissing Christianity. And uh, when Peter Mackenzie was in this house, the tour guide took them through the house and they came into the the main office area where Voltaire had spent many hours. And he said, uh, this is the desk where Monsieur Voltaire would sit and write his many books on philosophy and against Christianity. And he was very proud of Voltaire. Peter Mackenzie couldn't contain himself. He climbed over the cordon. He went behind the desk and he sat in the chair, Voltaire's chair, And he grabbed the arms and shouted out, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. I don't know whether the tour guide understood the English, but uh, he didn't expect that from good old um, Peter Mackenzie. That house became the Paris centre for the British and Foreign Bible Society. How remarkable that that was the case. Despite all the scoffing of Voltaire, God is able to turn things around. So, 
If ever you and I are tempted to say, what's the point of being a Christian? Don't they seem to be quite happy and satisfied with their life? They might seem to be, but they're not really. They cannot be, because they're in a state of rebellion against God. So then we see that Asaph, he's, he's, on, he's on the up now. Yes, I, I was wrong to envy the wicked. I was wrong to react as if there were no God, as if there were no law, as if there were no gospel. How wrong I was. They're in the muddle, not me. So then he goes on and he starts off with confession, doesn't he? Look in verse 21. Thus my heart was grieved, I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. You see what he's doing? He's confessing his unbelief. He's confessing that he was over impressed by the ungodly. Uh, they were in the wrong. Mm. The, who seemed to be in the right. Mm. He feared he was in the wrong. Even though he was in the right. But he'd been robbed of his assurance you see. And now he says I was so foolish and so ignorant. And that's where we've got to begin. When we've been in this particular state. Oliver Cromwell, in his famous speech at the appointment of the Major Generals, he said something like this, Make it a, a shame to see men bold in sin and shame. Mm -hmm. And then he said, The mind is the man. If that be kept pure, I don't see otherwise how there can be any difference between the man and a beast. And that was what Oliver Cromwell thought. Righteousness must permeate society from the pulpits, from Parliament, through schools, in families. Otherwise people will live like beasts. That's happening right now. And here is Asaph saying that he'd been brought to that position through his unbelief. So he has confessed his folly and his foolishness in this. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. So he's the opposite of the man in our Lord's parable, of the rich fool, who was confident in his prosperity, and yet he was a fool. He was a rich fool, but he was still a fool. And I don't care how many degrees you might get at the university, however much education you get, if you aren't listening to the voice of God and if you aren't accepting his son, God's law and God's grace, you are ultimately a fool. What a tragic thing. It was the foolish man who in our Lord's parable built his house upon the sand. It's the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And that rock is God and his truth and his son and our salvation. So then we find that um, Asaph has emerged from this vexation of spirit. Look what he says now in verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. He's now able to say things that the ungodly whom he once envied could never have said. They're going down, down and down into the depths of hell. But Asaph and all who believe in God and who accept his word and who accept his son are on the up to the glory of heaven. That's the position of dear Joyce Sandal in Northampton now as we speak. And I read these words on Friday to, to her. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. In other words, yes, he was still a believer. Despite his doubts and his difficulties and his disillusionment, he'd come to the depths, but the Lord held him in his hand. Remember, my dear friends, that whenever you have doubts, don't imagine that weak faith is no faith. Faith can be very weak. But even weak faith is powerful compared with no faith. 
And that's what he's giving expression to. We can't imagine for one moment that the Christian life will be without trouble and turbulence, battling with, with unbelief, especially because of these people around us. But let's be confident uh, of, of this, that the Lord holds his people in his hand. He says, you hold me by my right hand. We're in his grip. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And that's the wonderful thing. And isn't that exactly what Jesus said at the end of his time on earth to the disciples? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's what gives us confidence. Whatever these secularists and unbelievers shout about, and they mock our faith and despise our profession, Yet we can say this, you hold me by my right hand, you will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. And isn't that the Christian life? God guides us with his counsel, that means he teaches us by his word. And that's why preaching and teaching from the scriptures are so vital and so essential. You see, modern Christianity doesn't like the preaching of the word of God, the preaching of Christ calling men and women on the authority of the scriptures. Uh, this is what is needed at the present time. But that's not the way things are going. I heard with much disappointment an interview with the new Bishop of Norwich on the television news recently. I was not impressed. He will fit in very comfortably with the secular mindset of the Norwich City Council and this whole region. The things that he was saying. He'll be very, very popular. He certainly won't be popular with me or with anyone else who love the word of God. There was no reference to Christ. Reference to women bishops, yes. Reference to avoiding the right. And reference to other things. But there was, and he was concerned about refugees, um, which is a good thing in and of itself. But there was no sense of saying, well, I, I've come to be bishop to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the city of Norwich and the people of Norfolk. Not a glimmer of that. That's the tragedy of the present time. And that's what is needed, isn't it? To be guided by God's counsel. To be led by his word. But it's only when the word of God is foundational to our whole culture that we're going to get that. We were talking earlier about the wonderful legacy, the kind of legacy, if you like, our New Testament equivalent of what Asaph had. He, he looked into the temple and he saw the Ark of the Covenant and so on and so forth. We have the scriptures. How thankful we should be for those who, like William Tyndale, gave their lives for Christ in order that we might have the Bible in our own language. That's why I believe William Tyndale is far greater an author, a man of letters, than even William Shakespeare. Yes, William Shakespeare, there's a lot of the Bible in his, his works. But Tyndale was pure Bible. And it was because of that, the authorised version, the bulk of it is from William Tyndale. We should be thankful for those men. And all the scholars who have been faithful to the Bible... And then the preachers who have preached the Bible, like Peter Mackenzie, like John Wesley, like Richard Baxter and all the other great heroes of the faith. That's what we need. Because the end is what? And afterwards, receive me to glory. That is where Joyce is headed. That's what she is looking for. My dear friends, when your time comes, will you be in that same position are you so trusting in God, so trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that that is your confidence in time and in eternity? There's no one else who can help us. All the others are fake prophets, fake leaders of every kind. It is Jesus whom we need. Jesus is all that we need. I, I'm almost uh, at the end this evening, but uh, we must f see what he says in verse 25. We see... We've seen his confession, we've seen his confidence, now we see his commitment. 
Verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now he's not saying that he doesn't have any other desires uh, besides the Lord. Whether or not he was a married man, we don't know. He very possibly was. There are many things that he delighted in in life because he accepted the good gifts of God with a grateful heart. But there was no one to compete with the Lord. God was everything to him. God was first to him. Is that so for you and me? Is God in Christ everything to us? Because when that is the case, then everything else that Asaph is rejoicing in is applicable uh, to us. There is none upon earth that I desire beside you. There is no competition. And that's why a true Christian could never have any sympathy with the multi-faith mindset of the modern day. There is one faith, one truth, one religion, and that is the Christian faith. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There is no other name given unto heaven amongst men whereby we must be saved, said the Apostle Peter. Acts 4 verse 12. See, it's all here, isn't it? It's the, it's the gospel. Even though we're getting older, we're getting weaker,